Hello everyone, and thanks for watching. This is the second part of our series of repairing an L1800 DTF printer. In our first video, we opened up the system and discovered a problem with the capping station. We identified the error code using the uh, Epson adjustment program and referred to the manual for tips and tricks on how to repair it. In today's video, we'll go over how to remove the top cover, back cover, test the mainboard ink fuse, remove and label all of the mainboard cables, and the relationship between the breakout board and the mainboard cables, exactly what the breakout board is bypassing to make your DTF system work. We highly suggest watching our previous video so you can understand where to find the solutions for your printer's issues and how to diagnose whatever it is that's going on with your L1800 or R1390. Before we begin, we need to always remember to properly shut down our system before doing any electrical works whatsoever. Turn off the back power, unplug the back power, unplug the USB cable, and then come around to the front button and push it at least 10 times to clear any residual electricity. This should always be done before working on any inkjet system. Next, we'll remove the top cover. This particular cover only has six screws. Most DTFs are this way. Keep in mind that we don't need to remove the screws all the way. Just loosen them a few turns. That will allow you to slide the cover back and lift up just like in the video. Notice the screws we loosened are still mounted to the machine. They're just button screws that hold the frame down. There's no need to remove those screws. Let's get an idea of all the parts that we're seeing after the cover's removed. That is the ASF assembly, automatic sheet feed. Here is where your breakout board is. There's your head and capping station area. And there will be your external power supply, followed by your ink bottle location, where your ink and your lines connect. Next, we'll remove the back cover. After removing the back cover, we'll be able to see the mainboard tray and power supply tray. Do your best not to lose any of the screws. It's best to work with magnetic screwdrivers and bits if you can. Watch how quickly I remove these screws. <laughs> Try to keep up. Let me know if you do it faster. After removing the cover, we'll be able to see the outside of the mainboard tray and all of the cables and power connections. This L bracket typically has a screw in it, but it's missing on this machine. You can see the holes where the screw was. We'll replace that during the refurb. These screws are mounting the tray to the frame. So we'll need to remove those screws in order to get the tray out. Also, we'll need to unplug the external power supply. Here's a top view of the external power supply area. You can see the white cable coming from the main board to our external power supply box. First, let's get this waistline out of the way. Usually, I'll slide it out and I'll put uh, like a zip tie so I can zip it close so we don't get any ink anywhere. Be careful because typically that will be filled with ink. On this machine, it isn't because it's been dry for a while. There's our cable, and I can see that it's zip tied nicely. So I'm going to grab a pair of snips and carefully snip the head of that zip tie off so I can have a little bit of freedom of movement to be able to uh, disconnect the, uh, the power supply cable. Be careful when you're snipping. 
See how I try to just do it at the head of the zip line? These cables can break easily. There you go. Now the cable's free, and I can unscrew it from the power supply. Look closely at the male and female ends of the power supply. You can see that there's a little notch and a two-pin line where they all line up. We want to make sure that we plug them back in correctly when we put everything back together. Let's move on to testing the, uh, the mainboard fuse. Here I've got a voltmeter. We're going to set our voltmeter to the continuity setting and then use the probes of the voltmeter to test the, uh, the continuity of the fuse. Notice the little plastic housing. This is the test point for your fuse that a lot of the DTF and DTG manufacturers are including today. Let's use that test point. This test point allows you to test the fuse for continuity without having to pull the whole main board out. To use the test point, place your black probe on the top screw and your red probe on one of the bottom screws. If you hear a beep, then that means your fuse is good. Some voltmeters don't have an audible setting, so what you'll have to look out for is the numbers changing. A fuse that shows 00, zero indicates a fuse that is passing continuity and has no resistance, meaning the fuse is good and not damaged. Let's move on to removing the, uh, the main board and power tray. We've got three, actually four screws that need to be removed. This system is missing one screw down at the end. Remove the four screws that mount the power tray and main board tray to the ASF assembly. Be careful not to lose any of the screws. See how I'm using a magnet to catch anything that might drop? With the mounting screws removed, we can get ready to start to slide out our main board tray and uh, power tray. Double check your waste ink line and your external power supply cable just to make sure it's unplugged. And we'll get ready to slide out our tray just a little bit so we can see what's going on inside there. With all the screws out, we can slowly start to slide out the tray. But over on the right side, you'll want to be careful because our cables are still connected. So slide the tray out gently, just like so, but don't pull it out all the way yet. All of these cables are still connected on the right-hand side, so we'll want to be careful when we carefully slide the tray out so we can get a better view and be able to see the cables a little bit better in the next clip. Here's a good view of what you'll see from the left-hand side looking towards the right. You see all the cables still connected down on the right end? Still connected to the main board, so we want to be careful with those cables. These cables back here are for the motors and some of the sensors. Let's slide the tray back into position so we can reach the cables better and begin numbering the cables. Number one is a print head cable. Take pictures of all the cables and the way they look before you begin to dis disconnecting anything. Number them however you'd like as long as you remember the numbering system.
In this video, cables one, two, and three are the print head cables. These are the cables that actually go up and connect to your print head in the print carriage. Make sure to take pictures of where all the cables are plugged in so you don't lose track when you put it back together. Cable number four is a cable that's going to connect to our breakout board. That's our bypass board that the uh, DTF manufacturer made. This is not an original Epson board. It bypasses the page width detector or the PW detector mounted on the bottom of the Epson carriage. You'll see that it connects directly to my breakout board to bypass the page width sensor. You can see where it connects to my bypass board. Not all of these boards are the same, so it's important that you keep in mind and number these cables correctly. My next cable is cable number five. This cable is gonna go directly to the control panel in the front of the machine. On the L1800, you'll notice that there is some teeth missing. Your R1390 cables will not look like that. Cable 6 connects directly to our breakout board as well. This cable controls the automatic sheet feed and the paper feed timing and release which is bypassed by our breakout board. You can see where it connects to our breakout board in the video. Be very careful when disconnecting these FFC cables. Those teeth can get damaged very easily. Now that we have all the FFC cables disconnected from the main board, we can take a picture of the motors and sensor cables and go ahead and disconnect them from the main board as well. With all our cables disconnected and numbered, now we can slide our main board and power board tray all the way out of the machine. Keep in mind, we're not ready to remove the frame yet. There's still a few cables that need to be disconnected. Our last few connections are coming from the breakout board over to some of the motors and the relay board still attached to the ASF assembly. This cable goes to the relay board. It will need to be disconnected from the relay board as well. This is the relay board. It's mounted on the right side of the ASF assembly. There's the cable that we need to disattach from the relay board that runs to our breakout board. Unplug that cable from the relay board and leave it plugged in on the breakout board side.
The next cable we need to disconnect is the PW sensor cable coming from the print carriage down to our breakout board. I labeled it cable number seven. Our last folding flat cable is cable number eight, running from our breakout board to the relay board. Disconnect that cable from the relay board side and label it number eight. Okay, now all our cables are disconnected and numbered, and we're ready to pull the printer frame out of the housing. Be sure to watch our next video where we do pull the printer frame out of the housing, replace the capping station, and continue on with the refurbishment. Like and subscribe if these videos are helping, guys, so we can keep doing them. Thanks for watching, everybody. This is Joel with Inkdrop Printer Services. Happy printing.